Hello. Welcome to the show. My name is Brett. We do this weekly, and it's another Thursday, so yay. Thanks for being here live. If you're not watching this live, come back on a Thursday. Join us. I usually have guests. Sometimes it's just me and you, and we're just chatting about DevOps and containers, but a lot of time we have guests. And then the guest shows turn into a podcast, which you can find below. You can find a link to the podcast. You can listen to an edited version of this show, which launches every other Friday, and we can take out the demos and get really down to the the nuts and bolts of what we're talking about in audio only format obviously demos don't aren't great on audio only but in case you didn't know this show is sponsored by you you patrons out there i really appreciate it thank you so much for being a support of, for this show you're the you're the wind beneath my wings and on patreon we have a, a page where you don't have to give me any money if you don't want to. Totally fine. Just click the follow button there. Then you'll get a weekly email with all the updates, the open source I'm creating, the live show, the podcast, course updates, blog posts, all that stuff. Just anything that I'm creating or involved with, you can see that. It's not a lot of stuff. It's just once a week or two, once maybe twice a week. But if you'd like to jump into some extra benefits, you can support this show. And we have a high fivers group, which shows up every month on Discord. Discord is right above me. You can join our DevOps Discord chat. Uh, we recently hit 10,000 people in there. I'm very excited. Uh, that was that was a huge number. And of course, you know, there's people in there every day hanging out, talking about DevOps. And once a month, we do sort of a water cooler chat where we jump on Discord in the High Fivers channel. We talk about our projects. We had a great one several weeks ago. We talked about hiring and getting new jobs and promotions and sort of what you're looking for in a quality team. We talked about soft skills and things that aren't exactly technical skills and experience. So it was a really good talk, and I'm glad we have a growing crew on there. So come join us. Come check it out. If you'd like, you can uh, sign up over on Patreon. Also, the Discord chat, I just mentioned that. And today, uh, we I'm excited because the team has been heavily working on for months now our loot box store. So basically shirts, all the swag that is something, usually ideas out of my head, not always all the best ideas make it in here because it turns out you can't just make a Led Zeppelin t-shirt and sell it. <laughs> You'll get in trouble. So uh, I have all sorts of ideas that stem off of 80s looks, 80s stuff. So we're gonna be adding a lot more here. We just, just launched it with our first four designs. Um, you can buy all sorts of stuff, mugs, t-shirts. I'm not sure anyone's buying a lot of sweatshirts right now, but we've already sold sweatshirts. So ch come check it out. And hopefully there's something there for you. And I appreciate your patronage. So what I do is, uh, if you're a designer, by the way, and you're in DevOps, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always willing to support your work. Uh, I'm now working with several designers, and basically we split the we split the revenue on this. The little 50 cents we get per cl clothing or whatever. <laughs> it's, it's not a lot. It's not a lot. Not a lot of money in merch. But hey, I wanted to wear something of my own to conferences, so that's why we created this was simply stuff that I'd want to wear. to con Now that we're actually going back to conferences, I'm excited. So let's stop talking about the loot box. You can get that every week. Well, I'll be hyping that up probably for the next month. Right now, there's a 20% off sale. If you want to go buy something over the next week, um, that stuff will be a little cheaper for you. All right, let's do this thing. I'm excited to have two gentlemen on the show from both sides of the pond. We've got right in the middle there, we got Peter Van Nordenen. He's the head of growth at Slim AI. We're all Slim AI today. We're going to have a whole Slim AI crew. Martin Wimpress over there on the right, the head of community. Thank you both for being here. Um, someone tell me real quick, how did Slim AI get started? Does someone have the lore on this startup? <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I can I can jump on that one. So it all started actually like it goes back a bit, kind of back to 2016. Um, our co-founder and CTO, Kyle Quest, um, was, you know, very early in on Docker and DevOps and, you know, as a big security guy and working on all of this stuff. And he um, went to a Docker hackathon, the Docker Global Hackathon, um, with this idea that, you know, creating production ready containers um, is, is pretty difficult for people, right? So, you know, being able to take a tutorial and turn it into a Docker container, you know, it's pretty easy to get started, but, you know, doing all the things that you need to do to make that container ready for production, you know, he was spending a lot of time doing it. He was seeing his team spend a lot of time doing it. So he said, hey, is there a way I can automate this? And that was the birth of the Docker Slim 
open source project. Um, and so he created that project and it started, you know, gaining some steam. He was adding features to it, working with other uh, contributors. And um, at the same time, he was working at a company called CloudBlock that was um, in the Casby space and, you know, doing security stuff with um, our other co-founder, CEO, John Amaral, um, who was working on the product side. And um, that company was acquired by Cisco and they both worked at Cisco for a while, but they always thought it would be a great idea to come help developers solve this problem of creating production ready containers automatically. So Kyle was adding features to Docker Slim kind of left and right, including uh, tooling called like X-Ray that allows you to get a report on um, what's inside your container and the ability to create like app armor and set comp profiles automatically. Um, and Docker Slim really started to take off. And so that's how they spun out the company. They both left Cisco, began this company, um, came out of self mode in uh, end of 2020. And since then we've been, you know, hiring engineers, uh, building out our team, um, creating our SaaS tools that take a lot of the, the tools that are available in Docker Slim and make them easier to use um, in a SaaS. And that's kind of what we'll be showing today. And then, uh, yeah, we recently launched a Docker desktop extension, which was really exciting. We were one of the launch partners for that program. Um, we've been adding more and more to our SaaS, and we've just recently started working with kind of teams and organizations to help people secure their containers on their way to production. And that's really been kind of the story for us. So, Yeah, so born out of necessity. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and this is a topic that, we talk about a lot on this channel, I think, relative to maybe the, the latest, hottest Kubernetes add-on. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, it's it's something that I bring up regularly in my talks. And in this year, my DockerCon talk, those of you that have, ha this is not your first rodeo on this live stream, <laughs> uh, we had a DockerCon in May and Mm -hmm. about half of my DockerCon talk was just about the complexity of taking your day one image, like, you know, I've got it to work, and then mm -hmm. the evolution you have to go through of all the different things you have to know, all the different black marsh, you know, the, the black arts or the dark arts or whatever of of exactly what you need to make this image production ready for what I would say m would fly by most ops and security teams, right? Because obviously mm -hmm. shipping an image with thousands of vulnerabilities probably won't get you very far in an enterprise where they know how to scan for vulnerabilities. Um, mm -hmm. What you don't know sometimes can hurt you in this case because you've you've got an image that works. It seems decent sized, but there's a lot to it. And I'm glad you all are mm -hmm. attempting this because um, there's been a lot of attempts before and, it, and there's a mm -hmm. lot of subtle complexity in it. So I'm excited to dig in and see um, sort of how you're trying to solve it from your point of view, because I think that we've had, we've had a bunch of, I think I would say multiple open source attempts at this in the mm -hmm. past and i feel like at some point everyone sort of gives up <laughs> yeah <laughs> like you know in trying to solve it for everyone it's hard and it and mm -hmm. it ends up needing to have a company i think behind it to really drive the the intelligence the the amount of effort you have to put in to automate this so um where where are we right now so slim ai let's just recap real quick slim ai is the the organization the company behind mm -hmm. Docker Slim, as well as I guess now a growing set of other tools or features or something. Um, mm -hmm. I heard about Slim. I heard about uh, Docker Slim first, and so mm -hmm. Docker Slim. That, that's an open source tool. Tell me a little bit about that, real quick. Yeah, so sure. Docker yeah. Slim is. Yeah, Mark, the, sorry, sorry, Pete. No, go ahead. Uh, so Docker Slim is the open source tool that Kyle created and has been. Uh, worked on by Kyle and community contributors for about six or seven years now. Um, and it's the uh, the beating heart behind the Slim AI SaaS platform. So almost everything that we'll show you today is actually powered by Docker Slim. Um, what Slim AI is looking to do is to put some a, a good developer experience on top of the power of Docker Slim. Docker Slim is an expert tool. You know, you can go and download it from GitHub now and you can start using it today. There's lots of uh, buttons and bells and sliders you can wiggle, you know, with that tool to make it do different things. And the Slim SaaS platform is designed to sort of uh, give you a great experience in exploiting the power of Docker Slim without having to be an expert Docker Slim user. Mm. So that's yeah. kind of the relationship between you know the project and the and the company. 
Yeah, and the output of this tool, this is more than just a scanner, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's several things. In fact, shall we shall we jump in and start looking at what what it is? I mean, Pete, yeah. shall we start with the SaaS platform or shall we start with the Docker extension? Where where should we where should we go first? Ooh. Uh, why don't we start with the SaaS platform, but I do want to spend okay. some time with the Docker extension because I think for Brett's audience, it's going to be really super interesting, that Docker extension. It has a lot of the same features and functionality um, that we have in the SaaS platform, but is available on your local desktop, which makes a huge difference for developers yeah. and the development. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll show everything. So um, here we go. So here's a web browser. This is our site, slim.ai. And Brett's already had the Docker Slim website up, but you can find the project on GitHub here. So uh, github.com slash Docker Slim, you'll find all of the related bits and pieces there. Where we're going to start today is looking at the Slim SaaS platform. So you, your jumping off point for that, whoopsie, is here, uh, the Get Started buttons. This is all everything. Well, most of what we're going to show today is is free, free to use on the SaaS platform or the Docker extension. There are a couple of bits that are not because they're brand new and fresh, but we'll explain that as we get to them. So um, I'm currently logged in as a sort of an individual developer at the moment. We'll get into sort of um, some of the sort of, you know, organizational views a bit later. But um, the sort of doc, the, the Slim AI platform has sort of two two facilities, two modes, two key modes of operation. The first is a good way to describe it. It's sort of like Google for container images. So what you can do here is you can uh, use these connectors to connect to all of the places that you, all of the registries that you are pushing images, either publicly or privately, and then you can search and explore and compare images across all of these different registries so at the moment i've just as an individual i just have my docker hub uh, set up here but we'll look at um connecting up to um ecr in a little bit as well um so you can search through here and you can find the containers that you want to look for so you know if you search for nginx you will find the nginx containers or things that have nginx in the name across all of the registries that you have connected and if you know that you've got one of your own registries connected i have my own one here i know i have a registry um, with my app in it it's imaginatively titled i know um, but here it is here's my app so let's just take a look at sort of the the core functionality and actually when this got implemented Although Docker Slim is all about making container images smaller and more secure, what we were asked um, a lot at the very beginning was, well, when I run Docker Slim, what the heck just happened to my container? <laughs> so actually, right. we kind of went back and implemented a whole bunch of features to actually go and explore and analyze your containers because we realized we needed that capability before we could really start telling people to make their containers smaller to address this question of what just happened. So here's um, uh, uh, it's a, a single app. The app is irrelevant. We can look at it a bit later. It's a Python Flask app. It implements a really simple RESTful API. It doesn't matter that it's Python. You know, we could have been doing this with Node and Docker Slim and Slim AI work with, you know, Golang and Rust and Ruby and, you know, all of all of the other languages. There's very few things that don't exist, uh, that's right, that don't work. And what we also have here on the Docker Slim project in the chat, I see um, there's somebody going by the name Big Pod. He's one of our developer experience engineers, and he has been contributing to this examples here. So if you go to the examples, you'll probably find an example for your language ecosystem uh, that you can use as sort of reference if you want to start with sort of hard mode Docker Slim. So what I've got is an app that we have containerized using several different container composition techniques and base images. And um, you'll see that they're different sizes. And we're going to start with Python lazy. And the lazy here means this was a somewhat sloppily put together container. It's by no means a worst case, but it doesn't follow all of the container best practice. So this is 
analyzing this image from my Docker Hub registry. So this is just pulling that image down, and it is a big one. I think it was 350-something megabytes. Um, so we'll just wait for this to uh, do its analysis, and then we'll start looking at what you can drill into. Hello to everyone saying hello from all over the world. How exciting. <laughs> what, a, what a distributed yeah. audience. Yeah. So here we go. Um, this is my app as composed using this tag here, Python Lazy. We can see it's a 14 layer container. We can see some of the, you know, that what the files that are involved in the startup here. We'll just look at the overview to start with because this gives a good overview. Um, we can see the architecture. We can see the uncompressed size of this container, 938 megabytes. So the 300 and something is the compressed size on Docker Hub. Uh, we've got some key insights here. So we can see, you know, there is some potential to optimize this image just through duplicate files, you know, without doing any sort of um, uh, reduction in files in the container itself. Um, we can see what the application environment looks like. And we can see here, these are the shells that exist in the container. And here's all of the files that have special permissions, certificate bundles, and so on. So this gives a good sort of overview of what's in your container. And then here, we can really drill into. So we can explore layer by layer or, you know, the whole image. And we can see here at the different layers um, which files were added or removed in the various stages of the layer composition. So um, I think what we'll do now is we'll... Should we do a Martin, comparison, sure. Pete? Well, I was just wondering if maybe we dip into the app just so people... Because we had kind of talked a little okay. bit quickly about what the app was. And so if you go back to sort of the full view, that's not just yep. the layer. Um, just to kind of click in and see what like the files look like. So this is like a full file explorer. And Brett, I don't know if you've worked with, um, you know, there's other tools that have done this before open source projects like Dive um, yep. or, you know, other image, the old school tool. image layers. If you were, if you've been around long enough, you know about image layers. I don't uh, know if I know image layers. I know. Yeah, it was like, yeah, it's yeah, like, so. it's like eight years ago, five years ago, something like that. Yeah. Nice. So, so yeah, it, it was yeah. it was simple. It was simple. It was just a file explorer. It didn't it didn't do any analysis or it didn't derive any interesting information like that. Overview was uh, mm -hmm. the overview is actually something that I almost wish we had in, built into Docker. You know, it's like one of those things where I wish mm -hmm. you could do like a details uh, or an explain on an image inside of Docker, other than mm -hmm. other than the inspect, which gives you some nice YAML output, but not in a pretty way. So yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, well, with the Docker extension that we have, and we can show that, you know, effectively you have that same tool in in Docker, at least on the plugin now. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Extensions are yeah, well, extensions are the new hotness. Uh, we we really talk about extensions as much as we can around here. So, yeah. we'll we'll show how to use that as well uh, in just a little bit. So what we can see here is our app.py was added in layer 13. And if we click on this, we can see the attributes of that file. But we can click here and actually look at the file contents. And I did say it was a very simple RESTful API. And you can see it is indeed extremely simple. But that is the, uh, the app that we have containerized. Mm -hmm. And this was containerized using the official Python uh, latest base image. So batteries included everything imaginable that's why this container is nearly a gig in size for an app that is 387 bytes you know it's it's a bit much maybe so yeah. shall we um go and compare this with something else pete uh, i think we can do uh, that, well we? sure yeah go for it do you want to or do you want to go somewhere else I was just wuondering if we wanted to bump over to see the Vuln stuff um, okay. in the orgs, but right. maybe you're going to get to that later. So, um, yeah, I'll tell you what, we'll just quickly do this and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, do as mm -hmm. you suggest. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to compare the lazy version with the not lazy version. So effectively, the only difference between this one and the other one is the lazy version is including recommended packages, whereas, oh no, it's built against latest, whereas the... Python tag is built against a versioned Python slim, you know, tag from the official Python language um, repository. Okay. So this 
is looking at two regular container images, but this is something you might want to do. Imagine you've got different revisions of the container, one revision from yesterday, one revision from today. What actually changed? Well, here you can see, you can see the things that um, are absent from one to the other in red and the things that were um, added in um, green. So we're obviously comparing this large image with the smaller image here. But if we look at the image metadata, this gives us a good at a glance. So we can see in immediately that, you know, when you're not paying close attention to how your con containers are constructed, nearly a gigabyte versus 135 megabytes. Um, but as Pete says, um, one of the things you really need to be aware of these days is, well, what does being lazy with your container composition do for your security profile? So I'm just going to enable this slim sandbox organization, and you will notice at the top of the screen, it's enabled some uh, new features for me. And one of the new features that exists in this version, and if you're here today, congratulations, because literally what we're about to show you is hours old. It's brand new. So uh, you're, you're, see, you're all seeing this first for the very first time. So we'll pick up that same um, Python lazy image here and we'll go to the analysis view. Um, and there's some uh, sort of changes in the presentation, but you'll notice that a lot of this is, is the same. Uh, but you'll notice that we have this piece here called vulnerability. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the vulnerabilities here and let's see um, what happens. So, um, ah, okay, it usually, it usually populates a little fast. There we go. So here we go. We have 369 vulnerabilities in this container. I should point out this container was built just a couple of hours ago, and it was built with all of the caches flushed and what have you. So it is mm bang up to date right um and here we have 369 vulnerabilities and if we scroll down here we can see all of the vulnerabilities and if you know there's one in particular we want to look at this one's quite fresh we can pop this down we can see the vulnerability details we can open up the inspect the, the reports that exist in all of the other places that are tracking this and as you can see what we're using here is tools you, you, you may well be familiar with, Gripe and Trivi, um, in order to actually analyze these images and then deduplicate the results. Because what you'll find is the different vulnerability scanners have uh, differences in what they report. And we actually try yeah. to normalize that, that um, information. So you can actually see the stats by engine here, how they were different from one another. Um, nice. So, this is um, the vulnerability report, which you can download and you can search for particular vulnerabilities. But the question is, well, I think lots of tools are giving you this kind of information, but what's actually changing? Like if you're trying to address this, if you're trying to make your images more secure, how can you see that? So now what we'll do is we'll go back to the compare tool, okay, and we'll compare our lazy version with our not lazy version okay and we will now do another comparison so we saw the file diff from this before you know uh, what does this look like um so this is this is broadly speaking unchanged um and i think and all of this presentation is the same as before go on pete I was just going to say, just to highlight, right, the only difference between the lazy image and the other image is that one uses Python latest as the base image and the other one uses yeah. Python slim as the base image. And again, yeah. the Python slim base image is not related to our company. That's something the Python community maintains. But this is just showing sort of like what's the difference in size and vulnerability profiles just by using a slimmer base image, which has been kind of a hot topic yeah. recently. So yeah, yeah. But what we'll look at now is the vulnerability differential. So Pete's just explained what the change is, but here we can see that the delta is there are 321 fewer vulnerabilities in this image that, that adheres to container best practice. Now, that's still quite a lot, but it's 
a good it's a good sized reduction so now if we come down here we have a number of different ways of viewing this report and if we go to the side by side here we can now see the vulnerabilities that are common between these two revisions or tags however you want to carve this up so all of this is unchanged white is these vulnerabilities exist in both containers um, but as we get down the list, let's get beyond the 48 or so, we should start seeing, oh my gosh, here we go. Now what we're seeing here is these are all of the vulnerabilities that were in that large container that do not exist in the container that we have uh, prepared in a more conscious way to try and improve our security standing. So you can see, you know, a visual report of how these two compare. So that's a vulnerability differential. This is all good stuff. And again, you know, um, lots of organizations are helping give you insight into the vulnerabilities, but we can go one step further here. We can actually remove some of these vulnerabilities by using the minification process. So if we look down here, uh, we've got this PCRE2 out of bound stuff. The, I, know, I know this is quite a fresh uh, CVE. So what we'll do is we'll just go um, back to our favorites and we'll bring up the uh, Python container again, the nicely prepared one. And we'll just do a quick um, search. So that vulnerability report tells us that that um, PCRE2 is affected. So we'll just search for PCRE and here we go. There's a whole bunch of libraries and what have you related to uh, that library. So these are things that exist in the container that are do indeed have a critical vulnerability. So let's optimize our container. So we use the terms optimize, slim, minify, interchangeably. It means take the original container, analyze it, and then uh, compose a new single layer container. Um, oh, I'm gonna, okay, I'll have to put it in our cloud because I don't have this, I don't have this organization connected to my own thing. So I'm gonna store this container in the Slim Cloud rather than Docker Hub, um, but okay. Um, so we're going to call this container Python Slim. So this is take, but what we're doing now is we're driving Docker Slim. My application is a server application. And now I'm being asked here, are there any files or folders that I know I absolutely always want to include in my container image? We've had instances, in fact, Pete and I bumped into this. We made the world's best photo um, gallery app using Node and Nuts.js. It was, it was Beautiful. amazing. But yeah. when we minified that container, our tests didn't exercise the carousel to display every image. So our mm -hmm. photos, some of our photos got removed from our minified container. So if you know you've got static assets that you absolutely want to include always, then you can choose to do that here. We don't need to do that. Obviously, this is yeah. a, an API. It's, it's got no static requirements. Yeah. And the, something... Um... Oh, just, just to add to that, I think if, if people in the audience are familiar with Docker Slim or have used that before, the build capability there, um, they'll know there's a lot of flags that are available in Docker Slim, you know, 150 or so configuration flags. And one of the most common ones is called, uh, you know, include file or include file path. And that's just a way to kind of tell Docker Slim, hey, don't, don't touch these, um, these files. This version of the SAS is just actually making those those flags easier to interact with. Um, we do have another advanced version of this that like makes kind of all 150 different knobs and dials available. Um, but this is trying to sort of simplify the process, which is some of the feedback yeah. we've gotten on Docker Slim. So, yeah, and if you're making a sort of sophisticated API, you can export your sort of API map as a JSON file and feed that into this process to mm -hmm. sort of guide the process. So the ports that are being exposed are obviously coming from the Docker file. And I could go in here and edit my configuration. And, you know, if I if I know I want to tune it, then I can go and do that. But we'll just keep it simple. So behind the scenes, if I pull this down, 
here you can actually see this is Docker Slim doing its thing. So when I said, you know, Docker Slim is the beating heart here, this is one of the few screens where you can actually expose Docker Slim, you know, live as it's actually doing its stuff. So here it is. It's uh, pumping through. Uh, and what's happening here is it does a whole bunch of static and dynamic tracing. In fact, it's finished. There we go. So our thoughtfully prepared container was 135 megabytes. The slim container is now 23 megabytes and functionally equivalent to the uh, larger one. So we're looking at nearly a six times reduction, which is relatively mod modest, you know, for, for what we see. We yeah. usually see between 10 and 30 times reductions. And that's because this, this, pi this particular container really is an exemplar how to make a container the right way. The layer construction is on point. You know, everything that's been done to make the best possible outcome has been done. Nevertheless, we see a six times image reduction. So let's go back over here to analyze and view the results of this uh, slim container that we've just created. I have, a, I have a quick we'll question. Do... Sure. I have a quick question. on the When you're choosing what to keep, um, would that include like dependencies? So like in a node app, would I also check my node modules directory as like, you know, sort of like app directory and everything in it that I created? Yeah. Is that kind of what we do? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good question. So, I mean, there's sort of like the, um, it's, we sort of describe it like the Google, I'm feeling lucky button versus the sort of like Google search results, right? Where, <laughs> um, you know, the more you include or the more you sort of manually say, hey, don't touch this or leave this here, the less likely it is you're going to lose something that you absolutely need or want, but then the less effective the minification is going to be, right? Sure. So what Dr. Slim, the, what that engine is doing um, under the hood is, is running the app, doing the code tracing and static analysis, but then combining that with Linux kernel tools that like watch as the container, as we hit endpoints in the container or, you know, um, uh, you know, sort of light up the different code paths. And so it's making decisions about what it can keep and what it can't. Sometimes it's too aggressive in the yeah. decisions. And that's when you want to use the include paths to kind of like pull it back. Um, right. but sometimes it's actually like, if you just kind of include star, right, you're just going to end up with the same, <laughs> the right. Same. You don't want one layer, but it'll be, it'll be, It'll be everything yeah. you had, yeah. The demo that we that people <clears throat> interact with if they just log into the Slim SaaS platform, um, we actually do what you just described, which is keep the node modules folder. It's kind of the safest thing to do. The image reduces from like 1.3 gigs to about 300 megabytes, so there's still a lot of savings there, but yeah. it's not this sort of like dramatic 25 megabyte image. But it's also you know pretty much like hey, I didn't ruin anything in the. In the right. App, you know, accidentally. So. so. Yeah. So I guess you would do that when you're confident about your dependencies that you're. Um, and I get into this debate around. It's not really so much a debate, but the the talk around dev dependencies versus prod dependencies and how right. most images I see are shipping with they're shipping to production with dev dependencies. So they've got all the right. test yeah. frameworks. They've got all the local tooling mm -hmm. that they need on their local machine that doesn't have any necessity like npm. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, or pip, they don't, they aren't normally, yep. they, those binaries are not needed in production. <laughs> like you're not normally yep, yep. installing. So it is one of those things where um, at some point, when, whenever I'm working with someone on securing their image, I they run out of enthusiasm. And this mm -hmm. is like, this is like a, a point that I think is important to talk about that even if you're someone who knows how to do all these things and you mm -hmm. sort of break, if you were someone who was just like me, you've had, enough docker you've lost count of the number of docker files you've edited and you're you're mm -hmm. always in pursuit even if it means only five meg smaller you're always in pursuit of a smaller image there is there's a lot of effort in that like even for a yeah. pro there is a lot of work um especially with the like now that we have multi-stage and it's almost sort of a mm -hmm. um i can be my own worst enemy where I make so many advanced stages in order to clean up the dev dependencies and remove the fixtures from the testing frameworks. And mm -hmm. I, I get really into it. And then I find out, oh, the, 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 the image we're using has all these unnecessary things in it. I want to clean those out too. And yeah. mm -hmm. it, it, you, don't, you get on this rabbit hole where you're like two weeks in, like yeah. two weeks of serious effort. And I don't always, I don't always have... I mean, I am I am a, a perfectionist, but people I'm working with are all, honestly. I think they get worn out for me. They're like, they're like, look, this is yeah. too much. I just need a tool that like I, I need a one liner 
to do what you're doing because I don't have the patience to learn all that and to understand right. the Linux file system and how all that works. And yep. it, yeah, it's a lot. And sometimes using great tools like this, I think can be a little hand wavy and we're like, yeah, this is all mm -hmm. easy, but people don't realize under the hood, there's, there is so much to know about how your app is built on top of Linux <laughs> yeah. 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 that yeah. most people don't know. So there's there's some interesting points to dig into there. Um, and yes, we've seen all of that. You know, people who are, for example, data scientists, that is their area of expertise. They know how to manipulate numbers and large data sets, but they may not necessarily, excuse me, the cleaners have turned up again, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> always happens. Um, not this always happens. <laughs> um, um, but they are not necessarily uh, Linux systems internals experts. Right. And once they've got their three gigabyte container that works, they're happy. Their DevSecOps team may be, you know, having kittens, but, you know, they're happy that their container functions. And what we can do here is we've just done uh, the turned up to 11 optimization strip out everything I don't need. Some people get a little bit sort of um, cautious about that. So what we're working on at the moment is sort of different pre-canned levels of strength of optimization mm. that you want to do. And for what you were just describing, Brett, there are some people that are using uh, Docker Slim and Slim AI SaaS as effectively policy enforcement. So mm. they've used the include and exclude um, uh flags to basically say, I know this is derived from a dev container. When you optimize, the only thing you should do is remove the things in this exclude file. So remove NPM, remove all of the shelves, remove the interpreters, remove curl and wget and netcat and all of the stuff mm -hmm. that could be used against my infrastructure if somebody exploits a bug in my application and lands inside my container. So it's not quite the barren wasteland we're about mm. to show you from what we've done here, but yeah. it, it is a, a more hardened container that retains everything sort of from a software packages point of view that the developer prescribed their app needs. It may not be the smallest container in the world, but it's had all of that stuff taken out of it that could be your own worst enemy if you if you have yeah. a bad day and yeah. somebody steps on a bug yeah yeah and it, i think there are things there are like really simple things too right like shells right that's like a great example and i think we even show that in the, in this next example right yeah. very frequently docker slim is going to take shells out of the container you know because they are really not needed in the production image and in fact they should not be there they represent attack surface they can be exploited um Teaching a developer to write a container without a shell is um, is pretty difficult. I know uh, uh, Yvonne from our team did a really great Twitter thread yesterday that was like showing how to use a sidecar app in Kubernetes to kind of like shell into a container. A shell. It's a pretty yeah. cool little yeah um, exploration. Um, but you know, generally, I think like especially for people who are either new or like you said, you know, they just don't they don't want to. You know, they don't want to you know write a really really handcrafted artisan docker file you know they right. they want something that's just a, a process that they can run that's sort of who we're trying to appeal to with this tool um i yeah. think the you know the comparison tools are are appropriate for anybody right if you're working with your dev image you have multi-stage build you've taken a bunch of stuff out of it it's still interesting to see what the original image versus that image is and if it breaks, then you can get into the container and understand it. But the optimization, I think, is for people who really don't want to be spending a ton of time manually handcrafting container images to yeah. be as small as possible. So Yeah. And I feel like with everyone I've worked with, that's most people. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I've, I find very few developers, they have to really be into containers and also be a little bit of a tinkerer, a sysadmin of, mm -hmm. of sorts before they really start to realize, oh, like there's this, there's all these things I don't need, or even to just know about slim images, I feel like is an advantage mm -hmm. right now. So if someone's looking for a competitive and advantage in their job, like even just bragging about, I mean, people know about Alpine, but they don't necessarily know why Alpine, right? And they don't yeah. understand the the nuanced differences of all the different distributions. And my my goal and what you all are showing is sort of uh, applying my goal of I don't want to have to shift developers to to Alpine simply because we're 
we some people act as if that's the only right way to run a container securely mm -hmm. and i don't want to force people to that to me it's a distribution yeah. choice and i see that as a distribution yeah. i know people that are all in on centos distributions maybe not so much mm -hmm. anymore but used to be all in on centos i'm a very much an ubuntu mm -hmm. person i'm all in on ubuntu i like their cve count over debian i like the reduction in that i like the reliability the long-term stability and it's also what most people a lot of people that i work with they run mm -hmm. the ubuntu on their servers so they're already more mm -hmm. familiar Familiar. And so I, I hate to throw things like Alpine at people because I feel like it's it's changing their package manager. Now they got to go hunt down mm -hmm. all those packages and find the right versions and then find out that, oh, yeah, yeah. you can't track versions in Alpine they, over over a long mm -hmm. period of time. So it I'm, I'm very much about this approach, and I'm glad to see this kind of come to fruition because we've seen this. Docker's tried to do this back in their enterprise mm -hmm. days before Marantis bought, them, bought part of them. Uh, they tried this approach. They actually were trying to sell a solution to enterprise-only customers that kind of did some of this. Uh, mm -hmm. Not on, Definitely not all of it. Didn't have a web GUI or anything. But I, I've seen so many people attempt it and realize, oh, this is actually hard because there's mm -hmm. so much intelligence that has to go into it so you don't you don't break stuff. So sorry, I actually right. kind of interrupted the demo. I just wanted to no, jump on a, fine. on a bandwagon for a minute. And in fact, what yeah. you were just describing there, you know, there are different container composition options. You know, there is Alpine, there is Distrolus, there is build packs and all the rest of it. And they all, all have their place. But you saying, I'm familiar with Ubuntu, the people that I work with are familiar with Ubuntu, telling them to completely change their workflow is actually a lot of friction to introduce into yeah. their lives. And that speaks to the origin story of Docker Slim, which was expressly designed to keep your existing workflow and make smaller production ready containers without you having to go to, you know, another distro, another platform. Right. That's the, right. the whole entire point. <laughs> yeah, that's and that's a story I want to tell more because I I don't one of my big rules when I take on a new client is like not to not force them to change distributions just because they may be, you know, I'm not a huge Yum fan and I'm not a big Red Hat fan, but if they're on Red Hat, they're on CentOS, whatever, I'm going to try to stick, keep them there because I know they're more likely going to use these things if they if it's what is familiar to them, right? Instead of just yeah. approaching it from, let's change everything. <laughs> they're yeah. already changing so much when they're implementing containers in Kubernetes. So it's like, I don't want to change anything. I don't have to. So yeah, great. Yeah. Where were we? Okay, so sorry. Well, if we hop, if we hop, if we hop back to the demo, we'll we'll yeah. show some of what we've just been discussing for reals. So the first thing here, maybe you can see, I'm about to compare my original uh, image, which is actually in my Docker Hub, with the Slim image, which is in my Slim Cloud. Now, had I uh, connected more registries, I could be comparing containers, you know, across to ECR or anywhere else I've got them available. So we'll do this comparison now. And this is the best practice container versus the optimized version that we've just created um, using the, uh, the platform. So, uh, hang on, where's my mouse gone? There it is. Do we, do we yeah. need, um, do we need uh, like background music while we're processing? <laughs> no, no. Fast, we're having, yeah. having, so you can immediately see that all of the things in red that were removed, and that's quite a lot to navigate through. But what we can do is we can just hop over here to the image metadata diff, which gives us a good overview. So we can see here our container going in was 135 megabytes. This resulting container is 23. Um, we, uh, I hadn't heard this expression before, but somebody was explaining to me, uh, you, you know, removing shells and files with special file permissions and what have you, they call it defanging. So, you know, we have <laughs> defanged here. You can see there are no shells. There are, well, there's one directory, uh, slash temp, which has still got its sticky bit set, but that's to be expected. So you can see here sort of the reduction in binary count. That's like a tenfold reduction. Um, so, you know, this is good um, overview um, of how this image has become considerably smaller. So this was what, 23 megabytes. So this is built with, uh, uh, effectively it's a Debian base image because those official um, Python language, well, 
they do make versions available for Alpine, but I don't use Alpine for Python for many of the same reasons that you don't use Alpine for, for Node. Again, that's one of those subtleties of choosing your distribution that, again, some people that are new to sticking their apps in containers may not be familiar with and may not realize that what is meant as um, genuinely helpful advice to use Alpine is can be a bear trap that people are walking into unwittingly. So bear let's, trap, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's take a look at this. We've got this lazily compared, uh, la lazily constructed container here. Let's uh, optimize this. Um, this was about one gigabyte going in. Okay, so we're going to go through the exact same process with this large container, um, and I haven't actually done this before. <laughs> So I'm curious to see the results. But what we were talking about, you know, uh, people just want a solution that works and they may not have the best best starting point with their container. So here we are. We're choosing our worst case container that we have here. Um, and we're going to go through the optimization process again. And what I'm curious to see here is after Docker Slim has run its magic is how big is this container compared to the other slim container that we created from a best practice starting point. Um, I'm hoping they'll be fairly close, but I, I don't actually know because there could be a whole bunch of uh, different ways these, uh, these yeah. uh, Python versions. But oh, here we go. This is, this is more in line with what we see when we're working with uh, people in the community and customers. So our container going in was nearly 940 megabytes and the um, slim container is 50 megabytes. So that is twice the size. So there is there are some differences, but it's nearly 20 times smaller. So now, yeah. of course, what I'm really interested in is, well, how does that compare <laughs> to the other yeah. slim one? Because now I can actually like look at those two things side okay. by side. So let's do that. Let's do a comparison of the... I'll put the lazy slim on this side because it's the bigger container and I'll put the slim version here and there we go. We're both comparing them both from the slim cloud. Um, so we'll have a look. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is just for science at this point. So <laughs> um, here's the difference. So we'll have a look at the image metadata. So yeah, 49 megabytes versus 23. Uh, we should see that all of the, in fact, it's not showing us the shells and files with special permissions because obviously they're absent from both. So, you know, mm -hmm. this looks kind of different, but we've got fewer binary files in the mm. big one, but not <laughs> more size. So, you know, we could yeah. go hunting around in here to actually figure out, you know, I uh, wonder what the difference is. So, yeah. um, Martin. One of the things that you were just showing um, that I want to highlight to people, and I actually want to kind of like, because uh, I think it's a good transition into the Docker desktop extension, right? So we're showing basically, actually, we're diffing between different clouds right now, which is pretty interesting, right? So if you had mm -hmm. uh, a public image on ECR public versus that same image on Docker Hub, you could actually use our tool to see a diff of those two things. And that's kind of a fun and interesting thing to look yeah. at, or the difference between the Bitnami image and the uh, Docker official image. But one of the things that we've released with the Docker desktop extension, which you can find in the Docker extensions marketplace just by clicking that, that link on the Docker desktop and going to Slim, um, is being able to diff locally versus things that are up in the cloud. So if you have something in your Docker Hub repo and you have a change on your local uh, machine, let's say you made this change from Python latest to Python Slim, or you added some new addition to your Docker file, um, being able to diff those two things between your local context and your cloud context. I, I don't know, when the developer showed it to me, I thought it was super interesting and kind of mind blowing personally. So I wonder if that's something we could show here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I've got the Docker extension loaded here. We can look at exactly that. So um, if you've got Docker um, desktop, then just head to the um, marketplace. You will find Slim AI there. This again, like the SaaS platform, this is um, free to use. So if we look here, I've got my containers that I have built locally. 
Um, here they all are. And the the slim variants were built locally using Docker Slim. So one of the, you know, um, attractive features of having the Docker desktop extension is that I can now access all of these features of the slim SAS platform without having to push any images up to a registry anywhere in order to inspect them. You know, I can uh, crank the handle on spitting out new v revisions of my containers and do things like, well, let's, well, in Pete's case, let's compare. This is a poor example, but let's make it a little more interesting. Let's compare um, this version that's local with this version uh, that is in my Docker Hub. So <coughs> if you've got, you know, a revision of your container, you know, in a registry somewhere and you can't remember what actually changed, you can kind of use this process to do, there shouldn't be a huge amount of difference because the, the big change here is actually it's uh, built for, with different versions of Ubuntu. You can see here, we've got 2204 this side and we've got 2004 this side. And the reason I actually produced this was on the day of release of Ubuntu 2204, Pete and I did a stream where it was like, well, can I use our tools here to figure out if I can be like a day one adopter? You know, mm. let's let's re repackage my app in Ubuntu 2204 and use these tools to actually do a deep dive and learn what changed. Because you can see here, the container size grew by 20 megabytes. So, well, why is it 20 megabytes bigger? What's in this container compared to the other one? And we were able to go through that process and work out what exactly changed and, you know, test and validate our, albeit simple, photo carousel app. But, you know, on day one, we made the move and it was all all fine. So, you know, although I'm, I'm doing this comparison here with a local image and uh, one in a registry, it's all of the same, most of the same tools. What you won't find in here currently is the minification tool that's coming soon. Um, and when the vulnerability scanning capabilities are fleshed out and more, you know, polished um, in our SaaS platform, I expect you'll see those land here as well at some, in some point in the future. Was that the comparison that you were looking to do, Pete, local to cloud? Yeah, yeah, I thought that was really, that's really cool. So, um, yeah, and I just think it's interesting to see a lot of the similar UI. And then um, actually, since you're authenticated, you've logged into the Slim Cloud through the extension, then um, it also, you know, makes it easy to know like which connected registries you have and any images that you're working with in the Slim SaaS will show up for you here. So, yeah. And um, just to confirm real quick, a couple of questions. One, uh, Slim DevOps, is that your YouTube channel? It is, yes. Slim DevOps okay. is where you will find us on YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. All right. I'm putting that in chat for people in case they want to watch some videos and live streams that you all do. Um, Thank you very much. And I, we should point out, like, this is this is all, what we're seeing right now is all free, right? This is a Docker yep, desktop yep. extension. And for those of you who haven't checked out Docker desktop extensions, we've had the, we've had Docker on this show last month. We've had we've had DockerCon. They announced it. I think it's the the hot new thing of 2022 for Docker. Is we yeah. finally get this. We had we had an improving GUI over the last few years where the Docker desk uh, Docker desktop dashboard, the DDD uh, D3, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, uh, that that dashboard was getting better and better. But they opened up this extension thing at the beginning of this year, and I don't. They asked us captains first. They said, like, what good extensions would you have? And, and I actually had a hard time coming up with, I was like, I don't really know. I mean, maybe a log viewer and, uh, uh, you know, a, fo a, a size, like, what is taking up space on my machine? Because that's, like, the two most common questions I get from people. But then all these great extensions, like yours, all started coming out of the woodworks. And I did not imagine where, like, a world where I'd be deploying, you know, OpenShift Kubernetes deployments inside of Docker desktop, or I'd be yep. VPN tunneling to remote infrastructure from inside my Docker desktop, or you know something like SlimAI. Like this, the, if you haven't tried out, this is sort of like a, an advertisement for extensions. If you haven't tried out mm -hmm. Docker desktop extensions, they keep adding new versions, new versions of them, new options mm -hmm. in there. I, I, we've got dozens in there now, at least probably close to thirty, if not at this point. So for those yeah. that haven't checked it out, please 
Go try out Docker yeah. Desktop. You can use yeah. Docker Desktop for learning, and if you're learning the extensions, you're legally allowed to use it even on an enterprise computer. I have yeah. gotten permission from the the powers to be at Docker that said, yeah, that's what the learning is all about, is to learn features and play with things. So anyway. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was like Christmas came. Oh, sorry, Pete. It was like Christmas came came early. I was this guy. I think we were about to say the same thing, which is just to give a shout out to our development team. Like we, we, uh, you know, got the offer to come be a launch partner of Docker in the extension program. They were great to work with. You know, we did a lot of co-marketing. I think we have a blog coming out um, on Docker uh, tomorrow, maybe um, about our extension. But our developers like really crushed to get the extension out, and now we've like basically spun up a whole team that is just working on the extension because we're getting so many, so much interest, so much insight. You yeah. know, there's a ton of new features. There's always updates and UI improvements and stuff like that that we can make. So yeah, we're definitely doubling down and agree. I think the extension, and we've gotten to see other extensions too, which is really cool. And um, the extensions themselves are containers, which I think is really cool. It makes <laughs> total sense, right? But right. so you can actually yeah. use the Slim AI tools to go inspect the other companies' <laughs> extensions. And we were doing that and having some fun with that. So yeah. Use yours to figure out how to make yours better. Great. Yeah. We, we, yeah, we actually yeah. did. <laughs> we we yeah, actually yeah, did. Yeah. There were some reference containers that Docker provided and we used our tools to yeah. We really dig into them and see what was going on. And one of the curious things we learned is they were using Docker Slim inside their, you know, Ooh. reference containers. So it's Hot like, take. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I was going to say, yes, it wasn't just like Christmas came early. It was. It was also like my birthday at the same time because as a Linux user, uh, I had never had access to the uh, Docker desktop before. So not only did I get Docker desktop and I was demoing it there on uh, Linux desktop, um, but I got the extensions to boot. And, you know, whilst we've had the, you know, Docker runtime forever, um, I've actually switched on my local workstations. I just use the Docker desktop now for everything because yeah. it, it's another piece in that sort of computing platform parity uh, you know, that all, all desktop Linux enthusiasts crave, you know, it's another, you know, tier one tool to sit alongside, yeah. you know, things like Visual Studio Code and Git Kraken or, you know, if JetBrains is your thing, you know, it's just another great dev tool to to have available to and, uh, and not have to feel like you're the poor relation. Yeah. And I can pause it. <laughs> That's another one of my favorite new features yeah. this year is being able yeah. to just pause Kubernetes and Docker and just set it without having to quit, right? Because I'm always mm -hmm. I'm always wanting to run Kubernetes and Docker, but I don't always need it. And I, I get tired of launching and waiting the 30 seconds for the VM to start up. Mm -hmm. So pausing, it's been a great thing for me too. I'm, I'm assuming that's on the Linux side since it is a Linux feature because I... I think it's actually using the uh, C group or pause C groups on underneath yep. to actually uh, sleep those. Um, so, sorry, I kind of interrupted the demo again. Is there anything else we wanted to show on the Docker, uh, um, Docker desktop extension? Well, I mean, what I, I think the thing to take away from this is this is the same core capabilities that exist in the... SAS platform locally on your machine. So here you can see those, you know, overview reports and everything, and you can do the comparisons and the file explorers. It's all it's all here. And what we're finding is this is a great gateway for people to sort of access uh, our tooling because they can just install the extension and start playing with it, and you get all of that value and capability locally without having to go through the hassle of pushing your container images you know, up to a registry somewhere. Yeah. And Brett, Brett, you hit on, um, so it is free. The extension is free for anybody to use. Um, our SaaS platform is free for individual developers. All you need is a GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket account. Um, we might send you a few emails, but you can opt out of those. You won't get sales calls from us or anything. You know, we want these tools to be available to developers. Um, we have started working with certain design partners. So if your team or organization might benefit for some, from something like optimization, or the vulnerability scanning, um, just reach out to me. I'm in Brett's Discord. We have a Discord. Um, you know, we're kind of opening that up to certain select beta partners. So if that's interesting to people, please let us know. Um, yeah, and then I think the one thing that we haven't shown yet is just the vulnerability diff, right, Martin? Which is the that's the right. hot new tool that we have not seen yet. So I think that would be the end of the demo if, uh, okay, if we had time to show that. So let's yeah. bring let's bring up the uh, browser again then. Yeah, let's do that. And then Robot Glock had a question about CICD I want to get to when we're... Cool. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So uh, no, I think I think we have, but let's let's go back here. All the same, let's go. Oh, we to... did show that. You're right. We did show the vulnerability. Yeah. There. So maybe maybe yeah. we've already done this part of the demo. Sorry about that. Yeah. I tell you, uh, I tell well... you what we could do. What which we which we haven't done. We were talking about other container composition techniques and how you can have a more optimized starting point. Well, let's look at. In fact, let's go here. Let's look at this as an an option. So. Just because you start with, say, distroless, doesn't mean it can't be optimized, right? You 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 don't have to stop there. You can you know you can turn this all the way up to eleven. So if we take our uh, distroless version of this app, which is already twenty seven megabytes, so I suppose the other thing to highlight is when we minified uh, this container here, we got this container down to 25 megabytes so you know without any effort we were able to meet the the sort of the size that in fact this is compressed so this is going to be more like 50 megabytes mm, when we right. actually get into it so we're already beneath sort of the the distroless size here but let's let's just take a look um if we take uh this not a, distroless not a big container. fan by the way of distroless <laughs> I talked about it this year in my DockerCon talk. It's got yeah. Distroless is not the end. It's like Alpine. It's not the end all be all. It's not the panacea. It's mm. it's uh, it, it it doesn't have shells, but it actually has higher vulnerability count in my testing than exactly. Ubuntu did. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and that's exactly what I'm demonstrating here. So here's Distroless. You would say that you know an image that is smaller with fewer packages inside it should have a better security profile yet compared to that ubuntu image it has considerably more it has uh 31 so 31 compared to 11 i think it was something of that that nature and the reason for that is again i used our tools to dig into this i looked at the distroless base image because i was like well what actually is it and for the um version that i'm using which is called python for Python, it's actually uh, using Debian 11. And of course, the difference here is, is that when you look at the distros that are commercially backed, such as Ubuntu from Canonical or something from Red Hat or its camp or SUSE, those uh, commercial vendors all have SLAs for their security, uh, particularly the high and critical vulnerabilities. They sort yeah. of have guarantees around uh, fixing those vulnerabilities that are high and critical over the lifetime of the, uh, the supported lifetime of those distributions. Something like Debian, which is a community um, project, simply can't have the same commitment to security as something with dedicated security teams. And while Debian developers, including myself, do contribute security fixes to Debian, you know, we are not a full-time security team that's spread across right. the world that's responding to these things within 24 hours. So that's why DistroList may well be small, but it doesn't have the same security posture as, say, something built with Ubuntu or RHEL or SUSE. Yeah, but it's we a, can it's also a, whack the optimize button. <laughs> and that, that knowledge, you, you just dispensed the knowledge, by the way, that's, that usually, for someone who's new to this stuff and maybe not a, an old hat Linux person, that that takes years to not know like that you know it's that's that's there's a subtle complexity and experience that you have there that not everyone is going to have especially in their first year of containers i i actually mm -hmm. see a lot of people that they're actually you know there's a lot of windows people that are moving from windows development well specifically for dot exe binary development for mm -hmm. a windows server architecture that are moving you know to net core now or moving to just moving off a of framework completely to other languages maybe because those it's easier to find developers for those languages and they don't have this kind of information because they just simply don't have the decades of linux understanding to even understand the nuances of distributions and how they're different, you know, and, and mm -hmm. the subtleties of, oh, a community-based distribution versus an enterprise-backed, you know, distribution and stuff like that. So I think, I think that's what's great. Um, I'm, I'm and actually, honestly, I'm kind of looking forward to all of the requests you're probably getting for all the things that people should, you know, that want, <laughs> that want into this tool. Like, um, I mean, one idea off the top of my head is showing a different distribution actually in the background to compare, saying, hey, look, you're using the default if you were to maybe consider this other distribution. I don't even know mm -hmm. if that's possible, but... It um, is possible. Yeah, yeah it's, it it's one of those things where enough analysis in this, enough intelligence, and you could sort of just... Uh, you could really solve a lot of problems for a lot of people. So Com Coming soon, TM. 
<laughs> that's right. That's right. It's on the soon list. As as people on my channel yeah. know, I always say coming soon, or I will release that soon. And soon is a <laughs> soon means between now and infinity. So um, well, um, no problem. Soon, soon, soon around here does mean soon. Like the a lot of the stuff that we've shown you today, particularly around the the vulnerability scanning. It was only like four or five weeks ago I was doing my five best security practices for containers and I was talking about using Docker Scan and Docker SBOM. And I don't have to do that now because this tooling exists in our in our platform and you know mm. it's going to continue to evolve and develop. Um, and I suppose the the other thing to just quickly explain is we minified um, an Ubuntu container earlier. And there was a particular vulnerability in there uh, regarding PCRE. And that that module is now entirely absent from the minimized container. Mm. So not only so we, we, we say here that um, container size is not a vanity metric, it's an indicator of container quality. <laughs> um, and uh, and it is it's a key indicator of container quality I think because um, small containers tend to be thoughtfully curated and put together but if you are a good developer therefore a lazy developer you don't have to necessarily put those weeks of effort into learning how to sort of um, create artisanal containers you can you can take something that's a big fat mess and you can turn it into something production ready with yeah. um, relative ease yeah um, I I have a common pattern I I see with clients that I bring on that that you know they're dockerizing like over the last let's say four or five years they're dockerizing uh, they're at their monolith or sort of their traditional app that they're migrating into containers and uh usually by the end of the process they they hate the way their apps construct build is constructed like they hate they, they it's almost like an argument for for at least breaking up the monolith because they realize mm -hmm. they have a ton of dependencies they have os level dependencies and then app level dependencies and then mm -hmm. if they're a front-end app they might have multiple front-end package managers yeah. all in the way and they just realize this thing is really hard because those of us that have been on that sysadmin or the, the ops side of DevOps for all these years, mm -hmm. we were the ones they were throwing, hey, hey, we need these things on the <laughs> server before we run, right? We need you to put all these things yeah. on the server. And so we were the ones always trying to figure it out and we were suffering all the pain of the build engineering nightmare that is making the app run on a server. And now, I, and then Docker has really been sort of almost like my revenge to developers to say, oh, no, 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 this is this is on you. You need to put it in the Docker file. <laughs> yeah. um, and because yep. you're the one that controls your dependencies, you need to do it. And then we realize, yeah. oh, actually, so many developers don't know their own dependency tree. They don't understand yeah, yeah. all the nuances. And so we need we need more tooling like this to be able to explain to people, hey, this is actually how your app is working. <clears throat> oh, and by the way, you don't actually need all that stuff that you thought you did. Yeah. Sometimes people have dependencies they don't even know. They don't even know why those yeah, exist, right. right? I mean, it's so common. Yeah, most, and also most, they most... will have, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say also We're you'll find people up. doing, you know, whack-a-mole in their container construction, add dependencies until it works. And at some point it, it starts working, but you're really not sure what you actually mm -hmm. added. So you have this, this sort of, you know, yeah. this thing <laughs> this. Yeah, and and yeah. and then it gets lost in the annals of time. Why all of these dependencies are inside this container? Right, and we we did work with, uh, and this wasn't like a poor container by any stretch, but we worked with uh, a data scientist on a on an R container that was weighing in at about three gigabytes, and with little to no effort, we got that down to one hundred and twenty five megabytes, which is still a fairly hefty wow. container. But yeah. when you're talking about reductions like that, you're not just talking about making it smaller. But in some cases, it's whether it's deployable or not. You know, when when right. things get up that to that side, you know, a network timeout or anything like, and also the cost of transit. You know, if you're doing multi cloud and all the rest of it, you can bring your you know operational costs down as well by just dealing in smaller containers. So there's some upside yeah. apart from you know security. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. W one of the things that <clears throat> became clear to us as we were at at KubeCon, you know, we we're talking about this to a lot of different people, a lot of different developers, and this security story really started taking off, right? Everybody cares about their software supply chain security these days. And the number of dependencies that you have just creates an exponential lift in complexity of your <clears throat> uh, security profile. But the other thing to remember is that it's constantly changing beneath you as well, right? We were talking to 
um, a potential customer of ours, and they were telling us that they had moved their entire stack, their entire monolith over to um, uh, Lambdas, right? Containerized Lambdas, right? And they're super, super proud, like, like massive effort. They're like the new hot cloud native stuff. You know, they're super psyched about this. And then the... Uh, base image that they were using the AWS, you know, container base image changed, and and it broke everything that they had, you know. And so then it was like this <laughs> massive fix and rework cycle, and it wasn't anything bad. I'm sure the AWS container was, you know, getting security patches, getting updates to libraries, all of that kind of stuff. But you know, something we've been talking about a lot, and I'm hoping that is going to come in the second half for us is sort of like being able to watch and notify as containers change. Whenever you have containers with us, like Martin showed your favorites or that collections feature, um, we're actually like running analysis all the time on the base image or the container that you run and making that available to developers to understand, okay, here's the diff of like what just changed in your image because hopefully you're pinning your dependencies and you're pinning your versions and stuff like that. Um, and people aren't running, you know, latest in production or whatever. Right. But when you do have an update, even if it's a minor version update, you know, knowing what changed underneath the hood on that, mm -hmm. especially with containers, very, very difficult problem, especially when something breaks. So, yeah, we don't, we haven't really, I'm just thinking about like the history of uh, artifact storage, artifact, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, analysis. We haven't really had a good way. I mean, we, we all we all know the pull request process, and we all w have a hard time probably imagining now the idea of implementing a pull request process in a team, but not being able to mm -hmm. see the diff. And that's essentially mm -hmm. what we have today. And most of these, with you know, without mm -hmm. Slim AI, we end up with yep. a world where we're shipping the code, and we understand the code differences, but we don't understand the dependency differences, or even yep. how that code affects the dependencies in just the file changes on the artifacts we're shipping to the the servers i think most teams i work with you know they're they think of artifacts in a more uh, dependency nature where like i have this ruby dependency in our artifact store mm -hmm. it hasn't changed and i trust mm -hmm. it and i know i've tested it but they don't realize how the subtleties of their image especially like you're talking about if you don't pin everything including your apt and yum dependencies mm -hmm. even you know those things can change uh pretty and in a pretty bad way, I've actually seen database mm -hmm. drivers change a point release mm -hmm. that completely yep. killed the connection to the database on a new deployment. But there was no code changes, and mm -hmm. it was, and they only pinned the major minor versions of their apps dependencies. They didn't pin everything, and then, yeah. So I, I've just I've seen it all, and I know that it, more enlightenment or awareness of these mm -hmm. these differences in the artifacts we're all shipping to production is is mm -hmm. necessary. Certainly, yeah. certainly at least in third party tools. I mean, we haven't even gotten into how, you know, how do you plug in the CI processes? That's actually the yeah. question that um, that Robot Glock has was, is it possible to incorporate this tool into a CI CD chain to check for code yeah. smells before pushing into prod? Big Pod uh, actually replied a little bit, but I don't know if you wanted to expand on that or explain that. Sure. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm curious. Big Pod, Big Pod knows better than I do, but um, but uh, yeah. So it's primarily something we're doing with the design partners that I mentioned. So uh, teams and companies. So we have a number of people who are running in CI/CD. We do have connectors to all the major kind of CI/CD platforms. Um, we have some examples of GitHub Actions that you can use. We've built. Uh, an agent that can sit in Jenkins and sort of like run. And what it's doing is like when you get the the code pushed, then it mm -hmm. sends information up to the Slim Cloud. We can either run the optimization or run the suite of analysis tools that we have and then push those artifacts back. You mentioned the sort of uh, uh, PR for container changes. Um, we actually have a, uh, a case study of a company that's working with us to do just that. So what what they do is... They run in Jenkins when a new container hits their, uh, starts moving through their CI CD, it gets built in their Jenkins. Um, they send that information to Slim. We send back to them basically a Docker compose file that's a record of that build of all of the containers that were part of that, um, that pod. And then um, they actually push that into their source code repo, and then they have a, a PR there. So we do integrate with CI CD. We're building more CI integrations every day. And if people are interested, um, reach out to you can reach out to me um, find me on discord or um, on Twitter or at uh, peter.vn at yeah, slim.ai all, all our Twitter's down here yeah. in case people are wanting to yeah, reach, so out, reach out to me on on Twitter and I'd be be happy to talk to people more about it if if you want to kind of do a test integration and see what that looks like so. yeah 
Yeah, so, um, and to f help facilitate that, we're working on a slim CLI. So a uh, this is the agent mm -hmm. that Pete was referring to that you can embed into your CIC pipelines that talks to, you know, the APIs behind the slim SaaS platform in order to unlock all of that capability. And if you, are, you know, uh, are an individual developer and you're learning this stuff and you want to, access this then you can integrate docker slim into your ci cd pipelines and you can get a slightly more verbose and a bit more expert level tool but you can achieve some if not most of these outcomes using using that integrated into your tooling yeah we do have a couple of blog posts on the slim.ai site if you go to slim.ai slash blog there's a few there's an example with github actions there's an example with gitlab um, mm -hmm. I think we have one coming out with Jenkins soon. Um, yep. I don't yeah. know how people feel about Jenkins, but <laughs> it's, if I had it's one cool. feature feature request, it would be I I would love to see in my GitHub PRs or anyone I'm working with on their GitHub PRs the the CVE scan difference between mm -hmm. the main branch and what their PR mm -hmm. is about to change because yeah. I think yeah. for developers like. CVE scanning is now easier than ever. I feel like we've got so many ways to do it at so many different levels. And now we can finally with Docker scan, you know, because of Docker, we can now scan the dependencies that are on the server that are usually something that if you, th if you think back 10 years, we had to wait until the server was built. And then someone in the security team or the, sec uh, the mm -hmm. DevOps team would, would scan the server, you know, the sysadmin would scan the server for CVE. And those would almost be treated separately than your app dependencies inside your, you know, your app um dependency manager whatever pip or npm mm -hmm. or whatever but now we get to do all that in one place and mm -hmm. it's never i think we're like so close to that you sort of i see the diff of the code you're showing how i can see the diff in the artifact itself but also in alighting developers to saying hey since since the main released uh, there's actually been new vulnerabilities because this is one of the problems mm -hmm. I always end up having with, with teams is the CVE scans, as much as we want to make them as shift left, they end up always happening after things are getting ready. You know, the PR has been approved. It's being scanned by the production image registry or some tool on the, on, on the, on the eventual way to a server. And then everyone has to stop and eventually PRs get made to fix mm -hmm. new CVEs that we didn't know about, you know, three days ago or whatever. And I'd love to get that part of the process back yep. into the PR so that the PRs for the app code could also fix the vulnerabilities that they're technically introducing because yeah, yeah. They either they added a new dependency or dependency is now out right. of date. I mean, these are the things I see every day. And so I don't know if you do that yet, but that's my vote well, if I can put a little checkbox on there. We showed earlier. So we're working with an organization that is facing specifically the problem you've just outlined. Yeah. They are trying to catch up on crushing as many vulnerabilities in their containers as possible. And as quickly as they're doing that, new vulnerabilities are being introduced yeah. through, you know, just the new vulnerabilities being discovered in you know the platform that they're using or ad adding new um, uh, dependencies that introduce new vulnerabilities and we showed earlier that side by side report you know here's one revision of the container here's the mm -hmm. other revision of the container what was the difference in the vulnerability outcome between those two revisions so that capability exists it's just a matter of time coming soon tm before you know that kind of report yeah. can be an artifact you know that sits alongside your container image so you can track yeah. over time hopefully you know green going up and to the right and red you know trailing off right. you know that's that's what yeah. you want to be able to see but we're we're actively working on building out quite a sophisticated reporting capability around vulnerabilities because we have an organization we're working in who really, 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 really want that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Changing behavior. That's what a lot of this is, I think, about it. Right. Making us aware of things that are already happening that we didn't know about and changing our behavior is what I'm always trying to drive towards. So, well, mm -hmm. okay, so how do people get started? Let's, uh, like, do we, do we clear that up for them? Let's make sure they know how to do that. <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can, I can do that one. So, uh, if you want to just play around with the open source, just go to GitHub.com/docker-slim. Get started. You can download the CLI tool there, and and you go use it. You want to use the Slim SaaS? Just go to Slim.ai, click the Get Started button, and you can just log in with your GitHub account, and uh, off you go. 
And um, if you're interested in seeing some of the more advanced capabilities and potentially working with us as one of our beta users or design partners, then you can reach out to Martin or myself. You can drop into the Slim AI Discord um, and chat with us there. Um, and uh, you know that can that can help you get started. Um, we also have a form on on this page on Slim.ai that you can fill out, but um, that's a little formal. So. But those are the main things. And um, oh, and then uh, if you have Docker Desktop, which I'm sure 100% of your audience does, Brett, uh, then you can just go to the extensions marketplace, find the slim.ai extension, and get started there. Dive right in. So, all these options. Well, thank you both for being here. Um, and th thanks for those in chat with the questions and comments. Uh, this is a very important topic to me. So I'm, I'm, we've been planning this show for months. I'm glad we yeah. had it. Uh, we so finally bad. got all this stuff out there and congrats, um, to the slim team on all this, this great stuff you're doing. So, uh, you can, you can get them on their Twitter handles as well below. Uh, we talked about all the other things, uh, next week, we're actually going to have Octeto on. They're talking about Kubernetes as a developer environment. And I'm going to actually, they're going to try to convince me that I need to develop on Kubernetes because I'm not convinced. So <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a diehard local Compose fan, <laughs> but they're friends yep. and they're, they're building a great product. So I want to have them on the show. Um, and of course, we will probably have Slim back when they have some major new stuff. We're going to, we're going to bring these companies back so that we can see how this stuff is progressing. And I think that this is kind of, this is the kind of tool that every, every workflow needs as something to solve these kind of problems. So check out Slim AI. All right, everyone. We'll see you next Thursday. Have a good one. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Brett. Thank Appreciate you. It.